We gather today to reflect on Good Friday. Good Friday is the day that we recognize the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We do our best at this time not to point to the hope that is Easter Sunday, although we are secure in the knowledge that it will come. But instead, we focus on the cost of our salvation. Today's service is most in the style of Taizé. Taizé is named after a community in northern France. The music that they sing there is, is highly reflective and repetitive. The idea is that these phrases, as you sing them over and over, would gain deeper and deeper meaning and significance. And so we invite you to sing that same phrase throughout the songs. There will be other voices that come in and out throughout the presentation of the music, but you as the choir are invited to sing that repetitive song and to allow it to soak into your mind and soul. The theme of today's service is that the right response to the death of Jesus Christ is to praise and glorify God. And so many of the songs, rather than pointing to the cross, give praise to our Savior. And so I invite you throughout this service to recognize the goodness of the death of Jesus, what it brought to us, and how it changed the world. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Jesus, remember me when you come.
Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Yeah. 
Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed, over, handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. 
When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his heads, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sakbachthana, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound. And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb The ancient seal By heavy stone Messiah still And all cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow 
asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead, it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead, it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead, it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead, it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead, it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead, it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead, it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead, it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead, it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead, it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead, it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead, it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead, it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination. But instead, it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know you're seen. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by His hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You were always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you were meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. The cross, it was meant to signal death, but instead, it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead, it's our beginning. This morning, on Good Friday, our focus is on the cross. If the focus of Good Friday is on the cross, then what is so good about Good Friday? In the early Roman Empire, the cross was a means for death. It was the Roman version of the electric chair, or the guillotine, or a hanging noose. But it was drawn out. It was humiliating. It was an agonizing public spectacle meant to punish criminals. That doesn't sound so good. For these criminals, the cross was the end of the line. It was a way to deal with them and with their transgressions. To 
put them to an end. But when we look at the cross of Jesus, on that Friday when he was crucified, there on display, Jesus hanging on a cross, Jesus suffering on the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, we find ourselves right at the center of the gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel in Greek means good news. The gospel is a story, the message, the good news of what God has done for us. Here is the good news. Here is the gospel as found in scripture. I just want to share with you a number of scriptures that tell us the gospel, that tell us the good news. And we begin at the beginning in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, it says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created us. You, you specifically, and me, everyone. We are all created in the image of God. We are all created for relationship with God. You are created to be in relationship with God. In fact, that is your primary, that is your primary reason for existing. But we read in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. We all sin. I have sinned. You have sinned. Everyone. We have all chosen our way instead of God's way. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. What our sin earns us is death. Physical death, even more so spiritual death. Our sin separates us from a perfect, holy, and just God. But Romans 6.23 also says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 5.8 it says... But God demonstrates his love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Although our penalty, our punishment for our sins, is death, Jesus, God who took on flesh, the Son of God, died in our place on the cross. He took upon himself the punishment of all of us, paying the price for our sin, so that we can be right with God. John 5, 24, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He, is crossed, he has crossed over from death to life. What a great picture of the gospel. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Ephesians 2.4 says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Jesus Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. John 3, verses 16 and 17 say, for God so loved the world, for God so loved his creation, you and me, that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but will gain eternal life. For God did not send his son, Jesus, to condemn the world. God did not send Jesus to condemn you and to condemn me but to save the world, to save you and me. And John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, To all who receive him, to all who receive Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gives them the right to become children of God. This is the gospel. This incredible, simple, complex, supernatural truth. And the cross is right at the center of the gospel. On Good Friday today, we remember 
what God has done, the price that He's paid so that we can be in relationship with Him. The Gospel message is simply this. That something incredible has been done for you. One author put it this way. The Gospel is not something to do, but something done. The Gospel is not a demand, but a supply. The Gospel is not something you can do, but something that has been done for you. And it happened at a certain point in time. On the brow of a hill shaped like a skull. It was done for me and for you simply because God loves us. That is why a hideous cross has become the world's symbol of blessing. A cross meant to kill is the very thing that brings us life because of Jesus.
I want to share a couple passages from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I want to read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 53, and then also a few verses from Isaiah 55. This is what Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 says. Surely he, Jesus, took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the gospel. This is the cross that Jesus has paid this price so that we can be right with God. And that gospel, that good news, calls for a response. It's an invitation that calls for a response. And in Isaiah 55, we read about God's invitation. It says this in verses 1 through 3. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy milk and wine without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. This is an invitation that God gives each of us to answer the gospel, to answer this good news. And he urges us and calls us. Listen to the language he uses. Twice he says, listen. He says, listen, listen to me. And he says, give ear, come to me. He says, hear me that your soul may live. The gospel is centered around what God has done for us, for you and for me. And it calls for a response from each of us. Many of you are followers of Jesus. You're disciples of Jesus. You've chosen him. You've received this good news and you've accepted it and decided to follow Jesus. The gospel is what your life is centered around. The gospel ought to be what our lives are centered around. It's not a gate to just get through or a truth that we check off. We live out the gospel every day. And to you who are seeking, to you who are curious, to you who are wondering or unsure, the gospel is for you. This good news is specifically for you. God has made it possible for you to be in right relationship with Him through what His Son Jesus did on the cross. And He invites you into meaningful relationship with Him. You can choose even this morning to believe in Him and to receive this gift that God has given. You can choose to receive the gift of eternal life with God. He's inviting all of us. He's prepared a place. He's prepared a table. And he invites us to the table. And he wants us to join him and to be with him. And each of us needs to give him our response. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on this Good Friday morning, as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, we are so thankful. We're so grateful that you love us so much and you demonstrate your love and your desire to be with us in sending your son Jesus Christ to the cross to pay the penalty, to pay the price for our sin so that we can have forgiveness and right relationship with you. Thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that each one listening this morning that we would each voice our response. Some of us 
have been following you and have chosen you long ago and we've been following you for some time. And yet, God, every day we live out this gospel, this good news. Every day we live out this message that you love us, that you want us, and that you've made a way for us to be with you. And God, I thank you, and I pray that we would live in that, and that we would share that with those around us and with others. And God, there are some who maybe have never heard this message or have heard it but are uncertain. God, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that they would know that you were inviting them into relationship with you. And I pray that they would acknowledge their need for you, that they would acknowledge their sin, that they would turn from their sinfulness and their independence of you, and that they would choose you to follow you and to receive this gift that you've given. God, we thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all. 
the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.